Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Strategies for Pain Management and the Prevention of Opiate Misuse Among Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families, sponsored by SAMHSA's Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families Technical Assistance Center. My name is Samantha Holcomb, and I'm a Director of Practice Improvement for the National Council for Behavioral Health, and I will serve as your moderator today. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to some important webinar logistics. During today's presentation, your slides will be automatically synchronized with the audio, so you will not need to flip any slides to follow along. You will listen to audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure they are on and the volume is up. You may send us questions at any time during the webinar by typing your question into the Ask a Question box in the lower left portion of your player. Depending on the question, we may type an answer back to you or save it for the end. We'll answer as many of your questions as time allows. This webinar is being recorded, and an audio version of the entire webinar, as well as a PDF of the presentation slides, will be available on the webinar archives page of the National Council website within 48 hours of the broadcast. Following the webinar, we invite you to please complete a short survey. Finally, if you need technical assistance, please click on the question mark button in the upper right corner of your player to see a list of frequently asked questions and contact info for tech support if needed. I'll now pass things off to Cicely burroughs McElwain. Thank you so much, Sam. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We're really excited to have so many folks across the country uh, signing in on this webinar, which we feel is such an important topic for us to focus on today. We have a great uh, lineup for folks uh, that are going to provide some wonderful overviews to some of the latest and greatest innovations that are out there around chronic pain management, uh, specific to the military and veteran population. I serve as SAMHSA's military and veteran affairs liaison, and in this role, get to interact with our amazing leadership team. And today, while many of you might have signed in to hear a little bit from our Assistant Secretary, um, Dr. Eleanor McCants-Katz, she sends her deepest condolences that she wasn't able to join us this morning uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances. We are, however, joined uh, by a wonderful uh, partner within our leadership team, and I'll give you a quick introduction to her. Uh, Ann Heron serves right now as uh, my boss, and the Director of the Office of Policy Planning and Innovation here at SAMHSA. <clears throat> I've known her in this role as she served as our Director for the Division of Regional and National Policy Liaison, overseeing our work um, such as the Disaster Management Portfolio, our legislative, regulatory, and congressional activities, our tobacco and health work, our international affairs work, our territorial affairs work, and of course our military and families work. All of that in addition to the work of our 10 regional offices across the nation. And actually, before coming uh, into federal service, uh, Anne worked in the state of New York Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, where she served as the Director of Treatment. She's actually got many, many decades of experience in the addictions field, and so it was very uh, serendipitous that she was able to join us this morning to share the welcoming remarks from our administration. So I'll hand this off to Anne Heron. Thanks so much. Cicely, thank you so much for that. That was really nice. I could have done with one less many decades of experience, but I appreciate <laughs> the introduction. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody that's participating virtually in today's webinar. It is absolutely our pleasure to spend this time talking with you and discussing a topic that's both very personal and for many of us at SAMHSA. Um, we want to ensure that we meet the behavioral health needs of our nation's military and veterans' families, and that's really a priority for us. The issue at hand is that service members and veterans often experience higher levels of pain due to the nature of their work and service-related injuries and are at increased risk of opiate misuse. We know data from the National Health Interview Survey shows that veterans are about 40% more likely to experience severe pain than non-veterans. So SAMHSA's focus and work in this area is critical to recognize and address the unique needs that service members, veterans, and their families have, especially as they relate to chronic pain and risk for opioid misuse or dependence. SAMHSA's had a long-standing history of collaboration with our federal partners at the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense, and they're key partners with us in working to address the opioid crisis for this population. During today's webinar, we'll discuss the connection between pain, addiction, and opiates. You'll have the honor of hearing from Dr. Adam Gordon, 
who will discuss the issues of opioid risk assessment, mitigation, and opioid use disorder from the perspective of Veterans Association, VA, excuse me. We will then hear from Dr. Patricia Herman, who will discuss chronic pain and treatment alternatives. Finally, at the end of today's webinar, we'll be providing a list of resources and contacts for participants. So on behalf of the Assistant Secretary, the Chief of Staff, and all of SAMHSA staff, I'd like to thank you for your time and dedication in joining us today on this important topic. And I'll turn it back over to you, Cicely. Thank you so much, Anne. And when I say many, many, I just mean a great many years, but truly, truly, you are youthful in your age. So for folks, you don't have her photo up, but you would be amazed. Um, and now I want to go through uh, quickly and give a great introduction, and I promise to um, share a little bit about her background as well, to our director, project director there at SAMHSA Service Members, Veterans and Their Families Technical Assistance Center, uh, located at Policy Research Associates Incorporated. Um, Donna Alagata has been uh, for many years at the helm of this wonderful TA resource that SAMHSA has been proud to bring to our nation, and she has helped us to bring um, wonderful uh, opportunities for technical assistance and support to state teams. Uh, we've now touched 49 states, four territories, and the District of Columbia through our policy academy processes. She's helped to monitor a number of uh, very wonderful virtual academy works, and she's known for her uh, expertise in both strategic planning and bringing a recovery-oriented message to the work with our service member and veteran families. So Donna, I'm so pleased to have you join us today and to help us navigate our webinar this morning. I'll hand things over to you now. Sure, thank you, Cicely, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to, to hop on to this uh, presentation for a little bit to tell you about the SAMHSA's SMBFTA Center. Um, I'm excited about that because I'm a person in long-term recovery from alcohol and other drug addiction. I come from a military family. Husband is a Vietnam veteran, and my father died of the disease of alcoholism, secondary to pain issues, actually, and trauma from um, his, work, his work in the military. So it really uh, is something I'm passionate about, and it's something that as I look around the table here, we have veterans, military families, uh, providers who've worked long and hard with uh, military and civilian systems and behavioral health, uh, that our team has actually come together to come up with the idea about this, seminar, uh, this webinar and why it's really important to connect pain management with addiction. Next slide. At the TA Center, uh, we serve as a centralized mechanism for a kind of go-to place, um, and we serve interagency teams, we serve providers, peers, we're a national resource that SAMHSA has established. Um, for folks who want to learn more about how to strengthen their behavioral health system, their programs and services, how to integrate best practices, and how really to increase access to care and the quality of life that we all deserve. Um, we work with um, resources of all different types, next slide, where we actually encourage um, states to implement a series of activities that will actually close the gaps and help uh, service members and veterans and military families and caregivers to make the connections that they need. We do that through a lot of different formats. Um, you'll see here on this slide a list of some of the different methods that we use for delivering our technical assistance. Um, policy academies and implementation academies are really where we bring interagency teams together, one, to do strategic planning, and two, to really implement best practices. And um, we've really found over time we can get some amazing outcomes and, and progress where you can bring partners together and through collaboration accomplish things uh, that weren't possible alone. These days we have a lot of programs and services, a, a lot of fragmentation, but we're not all working together, and this allows uh, teams from different communities to come together and address priorities efficiently. We also host a number of learning communities that um, are ongoing in nature and allow folks from all over the country to, to join on often related to a certain theme. Uh, we're doing some right now on peer support services in veterans. We've done them on rural strategies, and um, we will be posting those online, and we'll be providing those links along with other resources at the end of this webinar. We really do hope that you'll take advantage of the resources, and one of the things that you'll see in this webinar at the end is a, an abundance of resources, and the webinar itself will be archived for your ability to draw those down. Next slide. 
So I really would like to go over a little bit about what we are going to discuss today. You know, there's really been a lot of research that's backed up what we've all had an instinct about, which is that service members and veterans have lots of different types of pain. Um, there's, you know, emotional pain, there's loss and grief, there's trauma. But the physical pain and the uh, details about what that means and the implications for requiring medication and requiring alternatives to pain, that's something that we really need to learn more about. We also um, know that opiates in particular uh, can be highly addictive. Yeah, they can be useful, but there's also a need for our, all of our communities to understand more about that. Um, and the, the risk here is that sometimes, um, different from illicit drugs, we can uh, have a prescribed medication and get into some trouble with that. So we know we need to do a lot more in terms of education and awareness. Uh, but in the same spirit of that, we want to be able to understand what alternatives there are. Uh, we don't want to, you know, ignore the fact that pain is real, and we really want to address that to help folks to avoid self-medicating, uh, which might be a, a tendency that happens when you do not get the results and you have multiple co-occurring issues going on. So today we're going to be looking at the risk factors. We hope you're going to walk away from this webinar with a real understanding of the characteristics and the special needs of veterans, military families, and caregivers, and what might put them at risk. Um, the, maybe a higher risk is what the data is showing us than a lot of other populations in terms of uh, prescription medication. The other part is that we want you to be thinking about alternatives to pain management, holistic things, options that you and all of us can be thinking of for ourselves and those that we care about in the community. And last but not least, we want you to be able to see that the federal partners, SAMHSA, the VA, um, the Department of Defense, we're all working at uh, every level, federally, on a state level, and, and a city level, and a local community level, a county level, where we all need to be addressing these interrelated issues together and not forgetting about veterans and military families and caregivers. So at the end of this webinar and, and right throughout, you're going to be hearing about a lot of approaches, a lot of resources, and we're hoping that you'll take those home and, you know, draw down on them and use them to address misuse and addiction in your community. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn it back over to you, Cicely. Okay. Thank you so much, Donna. And I think I want to just jump on to that last point. For everybody who's on the call, um, we, I know we have many federal partners likely listening in or folks that interact with our other federal partners at VA, at DOD, across the different departments. It really is a critical time for us around the opioid epidemic to be working together hand in hand. And so that's why I'm so honored that we're able to bring to you today remarks by Dr. Adam Gordon from our uh, partnership with the VA. Dr. Gordon, as you may know, is a professor of medicine and psychiatry at the University of Utah School of Medicine in the section chief of addiction medicine at the Salt Lake City VA healthcare system. Um, he has been a longtime colleague of Dr. McCann's Katz and has been um, so well published in this area with over 17 years of conducting research on the quality, equity, and efficiency of healthcare for vulnerable populations, and particularly doing so in the addictions health services research area. Um, he continues to be someone who, when VA um, speaks to this issue, is the first name on the list. And so we're so honored to have him joining us here today. Um, and sharing a little bit about the research that he's been doing over his career, as well as the unique perspective he has as part of the leadership team around substance abuse issues at VA. So Dr. Gordon, thank you again for joining us today, and we'll hand this over to you. Thank you very much, and I just wanna say right off the bat that it's just been a great partnership with the VA and the SAMHSA over the years, as well as all our federal partners regarding this uh, opioid issue as well as uh, pain among uh, a very vulnerable population that be uh, that being the veterans. Um, next slide please. So today what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available within the VA, uh, what we're doing with regards to uh, linking veterans to community resources outside the VA and particularly to hopefully inform you as an audience about what what resources uh, that you can uh, link to the VA uh, from the community in order to address not only pain, 
uh, opiate risk assessment and mitigation strategies, but also opiate, uh, uh, opiate treatment for patients who do have opiate misuse or, or opiate use dis disorder. Next slide. Just to let everybody know, um, I, I do not have any fiduciary conflicts of interest. Uh, I am presenting uh, my own work today, uh, and it does not necessarily reflect the positions or policies of the U.S. government or Department of Veterans Affairs. And interestingly, in this slide presentation that uh, we've abbreviated for you today in the next uh, 18 minutes is uh, part of a large uh, webinar that we actually had uh, in the fall of 2017 where we have over 1,500 people on a webinar uh, to talk about all the host of uh, uh, risk assessment mitigation strategies that the VA is offering. Now, I'm abbreviating a little bit today just to let uh, you get a snippet of what the VA offers as well as how we can coordinate with community services in the, in the field. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, what I plan to do is to describe quickly uh, the unique problems regarding pain among U.S. military veterans, uh, and particularly those who are in, in uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs or, or VA uh, services in, in healthcare. Uh, we'll then dive into describing some of the VA programs that uh, are really intended to reduce opiate risks among veterans and, and to mitigate those risks. And I mention this because Many uh, community providers that are not part of the VA are receiving veterans from the VA who have changed uh, with regards to their pain management or opiate uh, uh, prescriptions, as well as uh, uh, looking to the community to provide alternatives for pain uh, uh, rather than opiates. And then finally, I want to do a really brief review of some of the treatments that are available to the VA within the VA for patients who have opiate misuse or opiate use disorder or opiate addiction. Next slide, please. The, as mentioned earlier, there's a unique challenge among uh, uh, in veterans with regards to pain. Uh, we know that uh, almost 50% of older veterans have at least some kind of chronic pain syndrome. Uh, and many patients who have gone through the Middle Eastern conflicts uh, both in Iraq and Afghanistan and the whole uh, Asia subcontinent, uh, it certainly has come back from the military with uh, and into the VA with uh, pain syndrome. And interestingly, it, it's not uh, just of the male veterans that we're seeing. Many patients uh, who are female veterans uh, also have a, at least a uh, incidental or a chronic pain syndrome. We know that about 2 million veterans in the United States that are a part of the VA uh, system have at least one pain diagnosis. And of those, uh, in the past particularly, uh, as much as a third of them have been on chronic opiates over time. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we know that the veterans are more uh, prone to have pain syndromes. And the National Health Interview Survey indicated that about two thirds of veterans versus 56% of non-veterans have a pain uh, or chronic pain um, uh, ailment. And then finally, one of the things that we have to be very cognizant of is that many veterans have uh, more severe pain than non-veterans. About 9.1% of veterans have a severe pain compared to 6.3% of non-veterans who have severe pain, indicating that uh, you're often going to see pain uh, modalities that are going to be needing to be multifactorial for, pain, for veterans uh, versus those with, who are non-veterans. Next slide, please. We know that there's a big problem in the United States, and I'm sure you've uh, dealt with this on these webinars in the past. Over, overdose deaths involving opiates is a very big problem, not only in veteran populations, but in non-veteran populations. And particular interest is as the prescriptions of opiates have gone down recently in the United States, we're continuing to have a rise in opioid-related morbidity and death. Uh, this slide is a CDC slide, which is not just for veterans, but for all patients across the uh, the United States. We know that uh, patients who are overdosing on opioids uh, continue to be high, and right now the, the really drive is the heroin and other synthetic opiates, which are driving the increase of opioid-related mortality. Next slide. So the VA has really dived into this to try to uh, address not only uh, a pain, but also to address how to do pain treatment effectively and efficiently without uh, causing problems associated with opioid-related morbidity and mortality. This is a very brief description of some of the timeline of VA initiatives that have gone on over the course of the last decade. 
you see that uh, in 2007, there was a huge emphasis in terms of providing opiate agonist treatment using buprenorphine in the VA uh, and a huge push in order to look at uh, high-risk opioid medications and to consider how to deal with the, those patients with high uh, morphine equivalent doses. Uh, throughout the years, there's been uh, a, a push to do, provide guidances for VA clinicians and providers. There's been uh, standardized metrics for pain management therapies. In 2013, there was a launch of the PDSI or the Psychotropic Drug Safety Initiative, which I'll briefly mention in a couple slides from now. In addition, there's been some targeted inter interventions uh, to reduce opioids among uh, uh, veteran populations, particularly those who have uh, uh, opioids that are potentially not helpful uh, with their pain syndrome and may provide more risk than benefit at the current morphine equivalent dose. Just recently in 2016 and 2017, as the uh, rise of, uh, of um, awareness of opioids in, in, in the United States as well as the VA, there's been a huge push in order to do whole health initiatives in the VA and to think of pain not just as a medication treatment, but a, a need to do a holistic approach and a multimodal approach for many patients. Uh, and a lot of services have been really directed in, in order to uh, uh, counter the opioid epidemic. Next slide, please. In the VA, we've uh, adopted a, a care model for pain, and I want to briefly mention this. Uh, I think of all the slides that I'm going to mention today, this is a slide that's really important that everybody knows about within the VA. Uh, first off, we, we have on the very bottom of the slide uh, the understanding of education and self-care. So many veteran patients actually receive care in the community, uh, receive care outside of the healthcare arena for their pain. This could be multimodal approaches. This could be holistic approaches. And in many ways, uh, it's one of the first steps, the ground foundation for many of the care uh, for uh, pain treatments in the VA. Uh, as complexity comes up, goes up, uh, what will happen in many veterans who are engaged in VA care will then go to their primary care team. In the VA, this is called the patient-aligned care team, which includes both uh, prescribers, physicians, nurse practitioners, VAs, but also a whole team, including social workers, pharmacists, uh, LPNs, uh, nurse care managers, and, and, the, and the veteran themselves. It's a patient aligned team that the veteran is part of the, that team in terms of addressing their, their pain needs. Often in this patient aligned care team or in primary care, the patient receives screening and, and uh, an assessment of their pain. And if it can be treated as successful in primary care, the, the step care model indicates that that's where the patient ends up. And in many respects, uh, many veterans will remain in primary care within the VA and, and receive pain medications or, or uh, consultations to other uh, services for their, their care, uh, care care needs, uh, pain care needs. Uh, if that treatment is refractory, oftentimes will, patients will go to a secondary consultation. This secondary consultation may be multi pain specialty teams within the VA. It could be a behavioral health or mental health services team. An example of this is uh, mindfulness, where uh, many centers across the country are now using uh, mindfulness to address pain and, and mental health conditions. It could be uh, chiropractic care or acupuncture care, which many VAs have. And, and, and this, this kind of a tertiary care or secondary consultation system is something that uh, the VA has really adopted over the course of the last several years. The third step is really that, that really severe pain uh, patient in the VA who really requires a intensive multimodal pain uh, consultation service, which can handle and coordinate not only medication treatment for pain, but also holistic approaches, whole health approaches, as well as uh, unique approaches that typically are not necessarily provided in the VA. Oftentimes, uh, th these coordinating centers will often refer patients to outside uh, the VA uh, and you may be seeing some of these patients coming from these tertiary care or even secondary consultation services in order to provide pain modalities that are not necessarily robust in that particular VA, which is near your community. So many of you will see people coming from, from the patient line care team, the secondary consultation teams, and the tertiary care teams at tertiary care centers to the community to receive uh, uh, multimodal pain uh, uh, processes. And this is often seen um, with 
services that may not be readily available at that particular EPA. Next step, I wanted to, uh, next, should be next slide. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention a couple of the initiatives that uh, are happening on a national scale to not only address pain, but also to uh, think about uh, how to address opiate risk assessment and mitigation within the VA. Uh, some of this may be a little bit more VA-centric for many of you uh, on the call, but I wanted to let you know about what the VA is doing. Because oftentimes, veterans don't even know about uh, what this is. And so when they go out to the community and they're seeing you in their community clinics or in non-healthcare settings, uh, you can refer them back to saying, hey, you're, the VA may be, be doing things to help you with regards to your pain uh, and to help with your risk assessments of, of opioids. So one example of this is a Psychotropic Drug Safety Initiative, or PDSI. This is a nationwide uh, quality improvement program that is really trying to promote uh, uh, appropriate prescriptions of pain medications uh, and psychotropic pain medications for mental health uh, across the continuum. Uh, facilities in this initiative choose a menu of options that, uh, for improvement. Uh, this, so not all facilities are doing the same uh, but program components include quality measures, some decision support tools for providers, technical assistance, uh, and provides a learning collaborative between facilities about what one facility is seeing and to help another facility improve the care of veteran populations. And certainly the PDSI has been very uh, robust with regards to collaboration and partnerships with other programs. Next slide. The, one of the main um, aspects of this is to provide some feedback to facilities about how they're doing with pain. And I just wanted to mention this, that this is something that the VA is very good at with regards to comparing facilities and to improve facilities that may not necessarily be doing well with regards to pain, pain and uh, psychotropic pain medications. Uh, this slide just mentions uh, a brief dashboard of what uh, the PDSI is doing and, and, and looking at kind of uh, different scores, different uh, patients, uh, how many patients need to be actioned about in order to improve their, their pain and or their, uh, their risk associated with uh, psychotropic medications. Next slide. Another uh, uh, initiative that's uh, come on in the last several years has been the Opiate Safety Initiative, and this has been secondary to the concerns of opiates across the United States. This initiative also has a dashboard uh, that provides uh, patient-level data uh, to practitioners in order to help them with regards to opiate risk assessment and mitigation. Uh, it allows a robust uh, feedback to not only the provider, but also the facility with regards to how they're doing with regards to pain. Just to give an example of the OSI initiatives over the course of the last several years, from 2012 through 2017, in the fall of last year, uh, almost 35% uh, of patients and veterans received an opiate initiation. Uh, that's quite a bit of reduction in opiates over the course of that time frame. Uh, a concern has been a benzodiazepine and opiate co-prescriptions, and this has been reduced quite a bit in the VA, uh, over 64%. And over 81% uh, veterans are now not on long-term opiate treatment, or LTOT, um, uh, over the course of the last several years. So many of these patients have been reduced from a, a dependence, a physical dependence, or psychological dependence on opioids, uh, and um, uh, based on some of the risk assessment and benefits of that patient individually is seen. Um, and then certainly the concern has been, the CDC guideline is, is a good example of this, of high-dose opioids, and there has been a reduction of morphine equivalent doses in the VA, uh, and about 31,000 veterans are receiving less than uh, uh, now of uh, 100 morphine equivalent daily doses. Interestingly, I'll mention this a little bit later, is that we have a very robust system of uh, naloxone rescue administration. Many of you are involved in community efforts. The VA is providing these kits for free for all veterans, uh, particularly those who are on opiates, but even people who don't, who are on opiates, but want to have uh, a naloxone rescue kit can be provided. And we've uh, actually uh, provided over 88,000 naloxone prescriptions and uh, documented at least uh, up until, I think, August of last year, 102, 172 overdose reversals. Next slide, please. Um, wanted to mention a little bit about uh, uh, the academic detailing. This is one thing that the VA providers are receiving across the country. Uh, uh, these one-on-one -on -one, uh, pharmacists go out to the provider to profile them and to help them 
uh, reduce uh, uh, risks associated with opioid prescribing the VA. Uh, there's also a state prescription drug monitoring program that many of you are aware of. The VA is now linked to uh, a vast majority of the 47 states in the District of Columbia. And there's inter, uh, agreements to change, uh, to share data from the VA, uh, uh, both back and forth to the PDMPs across the country. And we also have a very robust medication take back program uh, and reducing uh, the amount of uh, potentially divertible uh, illicit opiates that are out there. Next slide. I want to branch in the next four slides very really quickly some of this academic detailing, and just to give you a, a sense of the system wide interventions that the VA is doing in order to reduce risk associated with uh, prescription opiates as well as benzodiazepines. Um, a couple figures, the next three slides. So, next slide, please. This is a, a chart that indicates on the y axis uh, average number of naloxone prescribed per month per provider, uh, and then the time month over time. And the two lines in indicate whether the, patient, the provider was uh, or the patient was exposed to an academic detailer that went out to them to uh, improve the uh, uh, naloxone rescue distribution. And you can see there was a seven fold increase in naloxone prescribing. Uh, among academic detailers who went out to the, uh, the VA sites in order to um, help them uh, encourage spironoxone uh, distribution. Next slide. Uh, this similar slide is uh, with high dose opiates, over 100 morphine equivalent daily doses. It, it indicates that academic detailing has done a great job and tumors are reducing high dose opiate pacing compared to those patients who were not exposed to the academic detailers. Next slide. And the final slide here about academic detailing indicates that there's been a reduction in uh, exposure or proportion of patients with benzodiazepines, particularly those with uh, PTSD. So certainly just a smattering of information about how system level interventions of the VA are, are really trying to reduce that risk associated with these patients. Next slide. One of the most popular and most uh, prosperous programs that we've done in the VA has been the opiate uh, uh, overdose education and loss of distribution. Uh, many of you do this in the community with the opioid overdose education and then the distribution component with the Loxone rescue kits. Next slide. In the VA, we've really done a great job of uh, prescribing these medications to patients. Uh, patients get these free. They're encouraged actually to use it not only on themselves, but also on other people. Uh, and it's been a very popular uh, with all patients with opioids, but also patients who potentially have uh, risks associated with uh, 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 prescription uh, psychotropic medications. Uh, as of uh, uh, like September of 2017, we had uh, 101,000 uh, fills, and uh, a major uh, uh, interest as to how this is distributed throughout the, the states. But certainly, there's been uh, some great. Uh, uh, in this, uh, in this intervention over the course of uh, the last several years. Next slide. Last two or three slides here in terms of risk assessment mitigation. I just want to mention that we are looking at opiate uh, uh, risk associated uh, by the patient level. We have an opiate therapy risk report that is profiled each provider, uh, actually each patient that the VA has, uh, and provides a specific uh, uh, assessment of what their risks are associated with their psychotropic medications, and particularly with their opiate use. And this includes opiate dosage and as well as pain score and severity that is measured in the electronic medical record. This is uh, downloaded uh, daily uh, to four practitioners in the VA uh, that they can uh, risk assess and mitigate those, those patients. Next slide, please. One of the most popular things that was going to be happening in the next two two years, actually it happened in the last year or two, and will be really pushed over the course of the next several years is the STORM program, which is a stratification tool for opiate risk monitoring. This leverages both VA national data and also does a predictive modeling about, uh, based on the data that we have, what is the risk associated with a patient's opioid use. Uh, the probability of adverse events include risk of suicide or overdose, uh, as well as providing some uh, a risk of uh, respiratory depression as well as other morbidities associated to opioids. And it's for patients who are on opiates, but also those pe uh, patients who are being considered for opioids for pain. It's updated nightly and allows a downloaded chart review note uh, for the provider. Next slide. 
this is an example of what the storm dashboard will look like in the VA. So if a patient comes back into the VA, if they're on opiates, you're getting a risk score of uh, risk of uh, uh, suicide-related uh, associations. You see the left side of the screen, uh, an overdose, uh, respiratory depression, what kind of classification they are for the resort uh, score. Uh, it provides uh, uh, a, on the right side, some aspects to reduce their uh, opioid risk. So you see the middle dark blue columns, how can I reduce my patient's risk? which includes strategies such as getting them down lower than morphine equivalent. It actually tells what each patient has with the rarest of the morphine equivalent dose, whether they got an oxal rescue kit, whether they have uh, a bowel regimen or a timely urine drug screen. All of this stuff is provided real time to providers to help them reduce their opiate risk. Uh, pharmacological pain treatments, which we'll talk about in the next presentation a little bit, is are these patients receiving not only uh, prescribing opiates or prescribed medications, but other modalities such as physical therapy, uh, other therapies such as mindfulness or chiropractic or acupuncture, uh, et cetera. So it really provides a real-time assessment and mitigation uh, process for, for uh, veterans. Next slide. With all this being said, I have a three slides here that I just want to mention that uh, many veterans are not aware that they can, if they do get into trouble with their opioid uh, treatment within the VA. Uh, and many of you may not be familiar with this as well, but actually the VA is one of the more um, early adopters of medication treatment for opioid use disorder uh, throughout the country. Uh, similar to the pain step care model, we have an opiate use disorder step care model, which includes both self-management as the first step, the second being in primary care or pain clinics or mental health care. And then every facility has access to a specialty care substance use disorder clinic or modality, which can be linked to either at that facility or to a tertiary care facility near uh, a community clinic. Uh, these include all the gamut, all the ACM uh, gamut of uh, 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 step care, special care treatment that is available to, uh, to, to patients. So the VA does have a very robust uh, substance use disorder uh, program. Next slide. Uh, this just talks a little bit about all the increase of opioid agonist therapy, particularly with buprenorphine over the course of the last several years. Uh, the first bullet is the most important point. Uh, we are now treating uh, almost, well, actually over 31% of patients who have an opioid use disorder are on some medication therapy. Uh, opiate agonist therapy with methadone or buprenorphine in the VA. Uh, very robust. We'll often send patients out for methadone care uh, because we don't, every, not every facility does have methadone for opiate use disorder, uh, but certainly a huge focus has been to improve access to pharmacotherapies for opiate use disorder. Next slide. We've had a robust uh, uh, external facilitation. We have monthly webinars on this. We have uh, active consultation and a project echo type of approach in order to improve the access and penetrance of medication for addiction treatment. Next slide. And then we've seen an uptake. So it, as early as 2002, we started seeing buprenorphine prescribed for opioid use disorder in the VA. And then since that time, we've uh, increased the amount of people treated with uh, both buprenorphine, uh, oral naltrexone, injectable naltrexone, uh, and any opiate use disorder treatment, particularly with methadone, that may not be reflected on this slide. Uh, so certainly, we've had a penetrance of patients who are now being treated actively with uh, medication treatment for uh, opiate use disorder. And you may be seeing these patients in the community, uh, and uh, particularly with all the community wraparound care that the, some of the VAs may not necessarily have. The last slide I, uh, is just to mention that we have a very robust uh, guidelines with regards to not, not only uh, pain control in, uh, using opiates in the VA, which was recently revised, uh, in part uh, secondary to the CDC guidelines that came out, but we also have very robust and uh, very active uh, uh, substance use disorder guideline in order to take care of patients who do have problems with substance use disorders as well as opiate use disorder. And these guidances have been very, very valuable for not only VA clinicians, but also non-VA clinicians and healthcare providers who recognize that the VA, uh, this is a mandated treatment. Uh, if the patient does come into the VA facility, uh, they have access to pharmacotherapy for their addictions. They should have 
the full gamut of treatment options. Uh, and all these guidelines do provide not only help for the pain patient, but also the patient who has a uh, complicated addiction, and then uh, those patients with both pain and addiction, uh, which uh, often are very difficult to, to um, handle. I gave you the two uh, websites there. I, I really strongly recommend that you look at those two guidelines. They tend to be very uh, complete and uh, very robust with regards to all the what the VA can offer. Uh, so I want to thank you all for uh, listening in today, and I hope that uh, 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 if there are any questions, that uh, we can have a very robust chat uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Um, really, it was wonderful to hear. You've really covered it from one end to the other, um, especially in terms of talking about the levels of care, really, that are available through the VA, as well as getting us all to think a little bit about how to integrate strategies um, and possibilities, actually, for alternatives uh, to prescription meds, but also how those issues can be managed. Um, I really have to thank you, and I hope that when we get back to the questions that people will be busy writing in. I see a few for you already, um, but especially the levels of uh, care that are within the system that you shed a little bit of life on, light on. I know that the reason we were having this uh, webinar was that we did get a lot of questions about what the possibilities were for improving um, treatment and what the VA is offering. And so now what I think we'll do is we'll go towards Dr. Herman. I'm going to turn this over to Cicely, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the possibilities and range of um, options and, and lessons learned around pain management in, the, in, in a more holistic way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Donna. And again, yes, thank you, Dr. Gordon. It was a great overview. And one of the things that I'm so honored about the way that this uh, webinar particularly came together was that we were able to find two extremely complimentary speakers. And so now we move on to Dr. Patricia Herman, who serves as a senior behavioral health scientist at the RAND Corporation, uh, also as a member of the Frederick S. Party RAND Graduate School uh, faculty there. And her research and the work that she's done within her career um, which has spanned uh, more than 35 years, really has looked at a number of uh, issues around uh, cost effectiveness and policy effectiveness, and as they specifically relate to some of the complementary and alternative medic medicine work around pain. And so when we looked at her bio and had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Herman through our contacts at RAND and the great support we have there with their organization, she just came uh, to the front, forefront as a great uh, alternative speaker for us uh, to speak on some of these issues that, again, just like folks from the communities and yourselves have wanted to know about what VA is doing in uh, relation to this issue of chronic pain and dealing with <laughs> opioids, um, we have Dr. Herman as such a great resource to look at some of these alternative uh, mechanisms, which have been so very helpful for this population. So, Patricia Herman, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and we're going to turn this over to you. Great. <clears throat> Great. Hello. Um, and um, thank you for uh, asking me to speak today. Um, first slide, please. <clears throat> so this is kind of the big picture of what I'm going to try to do. Um, I'm going to just give a little bit of background on what is what is technically chronic pain and um, how common uh, this is. Um, I won't spend a lot of time there because I have a suspicion that a lot of you know more than you'd like about that topic. Um, but I'm going to spend most of my time on uh, talking about what do we know about the therapies that could work for chronic pain or have been shown to work in different studies. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring you that kind of information in a variety of ways, um, like about five different ways here. Um, and, and so I will kind of walk you through these different pictures um, and then we'll summarize. So next slide. Okay, chronic pain is, you know, that uh, simply it's pain that goes longer, goes on longer than it should. Um, of course, really, I pro probably all of us would think all pain goes on longer than it should. But um, the the kind of technical measurement of that is is pain is usually initiated by some sort of damage or lesion, like you pull a muscle. And then that muscle, the, there's kind of some standard amounts of time for muscle pain to resolve. And if pain continues 
past that time, then it's technically chronic pain. Now, in practice, mostly they talk about, um, you know, that, that different researchers and, and the, the uh, people talk about chronic pain is anything longer than three months. Sometimes they say six months. But that's the definition of chronic pain. And there's been some really interesting research that I don't really have time to go into today, and I'm not really an expert on it, about that there's actually um, this switchover from the time when pain really has is justified to when it just keeps going, that there are some things that happen in the brain, and um, and there's some of the some of the new therapies that are targeting um, kind of the mind body connection um, seems to do well for that. Um, now, uh, generally, the the most common statistic that's um, pointed to here um, is uh, from the Institution of Institute of Medicine's uh, 2011 report, relieving pain in America, and this is 100 million uh, U.S. adults with chronic pain. Um, if you compare that to census numbers, um, that's about 43% of the adult population. So that's that's a that's too many. Um, so it's a very common uh, problem. Um, and as Dr. Gordon went into in more detail, um, these chronic pain is more prevalent in the military and the veteran populations. Um, so we need to do something about this. Uh, next slide. The first um, way I'm going to uh, show some pictures about what do we know about um, the therapies that can work for chronic pain um, are, are these pictures called evidence maps. And these maps are kind of one-page snapshots about what do we know. Um, when, when there's a bunch of uh, clinical trials that are done on a particular topic, those trials, you know, are put together in what are called systematic reviews. Well, these evidence maps are reviews of all the systematic reviews that have been done. So it's a, it's a really you know, 30,000 foot level. Um, next slide. <clears throat> and there's some, you know, limitations about what, you know, how precise this can be. But next slide. Um, let's take a look at one here. This is a map, an evidence map for acupuncture, just for all the things that acupuncture has been studied for that are pain related. Now, acupuncture is a very well studied um, intervention. Um, there's a lot we know about it. Um, and this, um, let me tell you about how you read this map. Um, uh, this is called a bubble map or bubble plot. Um, and this one has four columns. And the column on the far left is evidence that says that there's um, no evidence of effect. Then the next column over from that, um, so second from the left, that column is, um, represents um, things where it's unclear. You know, some studies went one way, some studies went the other way. We just don't know for sure. But the, they've been studied. The next column over from that is that there's evidence of a potential positive benefit of acupuncture for these conditions. And then the far right column, um, because we've done so much in acupuncture, the far right column are slam dunks. These things, uh, for these conditions, acupuncture is highly likely to work, and um, the evidence shows that. How high the bubble is on the map indicates how many studies have been done. And then how big the circle is, is how much confidence we have um, in, in the uh, effectiveness of acupuncture for this kind of pain. So you'll see there that um, I've highlighted some of these because unfortunately the words get so small, um, but I did give the PMID number over there on the left. Um, and if you look that up, you can get an actual copy on your, um, of the whole study on your, um, on your computer. So uh, if you are someone who has just chronic pain in general, headache or migraine, acupuncture is something you should think about. 
Um, it, it, it looks like the evidence says that that really um, might work. And then there's this whole cluster in the second to the right one, which looks like a potentially um, good, uh, uh, good outcome. Um, and I highlighted, for example, um, uh, temp temporal mandibular disorder, or TMJ, um, as one there. The, sec the, the next column over, the second to the left, um, now these are where it's in a bit of the gray area. Sometimes it works or not. Still might consider it, but not as good evidence. Um, and then the far, far left one there is just, it's, it's, isn't working. No, nobody's showing that it's working. So that gives you an idea of the picture for acupuncture for pain. So acupuncture looks like something definitely to consider um, for a lot of different types of pain. Next slide. <clears throat> so here's an evidence map for Tai Chi. And for those of you who don't know, um, Tai Chi uh, was developed in China. It's, a, um, uh, it's in an intervention where you are uh, doing slow, gentle motions, and you're doing deep breathing. And it's kind of a mind-body uh, intervention. Um, if any of you live in big cities and you look out sometimes and you see in a park, uh, there's a group of people all kind of moving together, they're doing Tai Chi often. Um, and um, so Tai Chi has still a lot of studies, as you can see here, but not as many in pain. Um, so I highlighted two major ones here in pain. Um, and again, with a fewer studies, the, the far right is now evidence of potential effect. The middle is, we don't know, could go either way kind of thing. Um, but it looks like um, Tai Chi is a good thing for osteoarthritis. Um, and then there have been studies for pain in general, and it looks like it helps um, or is the, the potential for help there. Next slide. This is a slide of all the studies for mindfulness meditation. Um, and meditation, again, if, for those who don't know, um, is, is simply a conscious mental process where you try to suspend the stream of thoughts that go through your brain and relax the body and mind. Um, and mindfulness meditation has a focus, uh, tries to focus the attention or the goal is to focus your attention on physical sensations, like maybe your breathing. And this is to bring you into the present. So you're not kind of mind wandering all over into the future and the past and so on, that you just come into the present. And um, as you can see, again, the far right one here is uh, the, uh, the column that shows there's evidence of potential benefit. And again, for pain in general, um, looks like mindfulness can help. Um, and then on the far left, you can see fibromyalgia is another pain, um, uh, pain consideration, and uh, it is, doesn't seem to be helped by mindfulness meditation. Okay, next slide. So those were kind of just a, a sampling of evidence maps. And there are some more out there. Um, the VA has invested in these to be able to help uh, clinicians know um, what has been studied, what might work um, and it, for pain and for other conditions. Now I'm going to just talk briefly about a big study that uh, we are doing here at RAND. Uh, this was um, a center of excellence study that was funded by the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And one part of this study <clears throat> is where we tried, and this study focuses on chronic low back pain and chronic neck pain. And so <clears throat> one part of this study was for us to look across all of the different kinds of interventions that have been used for chronic low back pain, chronic neck pain, and try to put them all on the level playing field so you can see what kinds of things seem to work better than other things. And we also looked at what things cost more or not. Next slide. <clears throat> so here is the list that we looked at. Um, and we mainly looked on the left-hand side there, that list. 
Um, on the, uh, the right-hand side were other things that have been used, but um, the, we worked with several expert panels, and they, you know, and we were looking at the data available from studies, and the studies weren't as good or the panels weren't as interested in those ones on the right. So we mostly focused on these ones on the left. Next slide. And this graph tries to bring, this is one slice of that bringing everything onto the, the same, um, to a level playing field and putting these things all side by side. Now, the higher you go on the graph, the better the outcome. And the outcome right here is measured in what's called quality adjusted life years. But another way to think of it is health-related quality of life, where it brings in pain and disability and function and a lot of things to try to uh, have a kind of a universal measure of benefit. Um, on the far left, surprisingly enough, is one of our one of the only um, studies of an opioid that was um, eligible for being included in this particular analysis. And um, it didn't do very well compared to the other things here. Um, you'll see that then you go up to a whole bunch of things in the middle, what are you know various kinds of spinal manipulation, uh, physical therapy, massage, acupuncture is a little bit over to the right. Um, and then uh, there's a couple things, active trunk exercise, that was one-on-one -on -one exercise with a physical therapist. Flexion distraction is a kind of mobilization that's done, spinal mobilization done by chiropractors. And then the far right is yoga. And it just seems to really uh, improve function in people. Next slide. This, this one is basically saying that this brings in the dimension of cost. So the higher the dot is on the slide, the more cost it is. Uh, the farther to the right it is, the better the effects. So the, the, the right and left distance, that was captured in the previous slide. This just simply adds costs. And t traditionally, if a dot is below that diagonal line, it's considered cost effective. Um, but basically, you need to pay some attention to costs because we have to find out what can the healthcare system afford um, in being able to offer these things? And the good news is most of them are very cost effective. Um, next slide. <clears throat> now I'm jumping to one other study. Um, and this is, um, I wanted to delve a little deeper into a particular study that was done recently and it was published in JAMA um, late last year. Uh, a nice large study, uh, 342 participants, all with chronic low back pain. This study was done at uh, Group Health Cooperative, which is uh, up in Seattle, um, but it, it, which is now a, a, a part of Kaiser Permanente. Um, and it compared three um, mind-body options for uh, chronic low back pain. Well, it compared group cognitive behavioral therapy for pain to group mindfulness-based stress reduction, and, and I'll talk about what these were. And then we had also one group that got randomized to only getting usual care. Um, and then they collected data over a, a year, and then we also did a cost-effectiveness analysis. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so basically, everyone in the study got usual care. Nobody was banned from going to their doctor and, and getting whatever else other help they needed. Um, and then there was a group that was um, randomized to group cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain. This was done two hours per week in two-hour sessions, one time per week, um, and led by psychologists. And mainly the, the focus here um, is uh, that, that this was education about chronic pain and changing the, the, dis, the thoughts that aren't helpful um, for that. Um, okay. Um, and uh, let's see. So next slide. 
I'm not sure how you guys want me to answer questions that pop up over here on the on this, but um, uh, the simple answer is no. So I don't know if you want me to go into it or not. Um, Okay, great. They're going to hold the questions for later. Um, okay, there was another group that was randomized to group mindfulness-based stress reduction. Now, mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, again, was offered in two-hour sessions, once a week for eight weeks. There was also an optional six-hour retreat, which is the classical way that mindfulness-based stress reduction is taught. Um, we had long experience, and these classes did... Um, mindfulness meditation, which we talked about, they included a bit of yoga, and they also included this body scan or this being aware of your body thing. Um, um, and uh, both of the, the groups were what they call manualized, so that they're standardized so they could be replicated other place. And they also both had uh, information that was sent home so people could do this on their own at home. Next slide. So this is how it turned out, and we were very excited. Um, when you compare the cognitive, group cognitive behavioral therapy for pain to usual care alone, the, cogn the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, did much better. They had um, lower disability um, at both uh, uh, six months and one year. Now, remember, this is... This is eight weeks of treatment, and then you're turned off on your own. And then they measured uh, impacts over the entire year. So across the whole year, um, they they had much lower, um, you know, disability uh, scores and much less pain. And they measured pain as in pain bothersomeness, um, and that was lower. They also improved their quality adjusted life years. Remember, we talked about that health-related quality of life by 0.041 across the year. Now that puts the, them pretty smack in the middle of that graph, um, if, uh, if you remember um, that graph. Next slide. <clears throat> well, actually a little bit toward the top. Um, okay, mindfulness-based stress reduction also did better than usual care. And very similar results, maybe even a little bit better on the disability um, questionnaire, uh, but uh, definitely did better at both six months and one year. Um, and the quality adjusted life year gain was 0.036. And again, that's kind of over on the far right, not quite to the top, but pretty good. And they also found that cognitive behavioral therapy was not significantly different than mindfulness-based stress reduction. And, and given that there sometimes can be um, shortages in uh, psychologists that can do cognitive behavioral therapy for pain, um, one, of the, one of the benefits of this is that then there's another option. Um, so, uh, so great results, very exciting. Um, and then we did the cost effectiveness and uh, the CBT costs about the same as usual care, so definitely worth doing. Um, and the mindfulness stress based stress reduction actually uh, reduced health care costs overall um, quite dramatically, so that was very exciting. okay, next slide <clears throat> This is just a quick peek, um, and I'll spend just a second here um, and that is uh, again part of that big center grant we're following over two thousand patients who are managing their chronic low back and neck pain with chiropractic care. And you just get a little snapshot in here. Um, and I want to point you to the very last point there, that almost half of those who used opioids often always in the past six months said that they decreased their use on chiropractic care. Next slide. Um, this was something I wanted to point out about the, a recent report that has come out that is um, uh, that has looked at the evidence around these various interventions, and they recommended that um, all of them, but Tai Chi, they're just worried that there's not quite enough information yet about Tai Chi. All of these were uh, uh, adequate to support coverage. They basically recommended that insurance companies start to cover these things. So that's a good, a great step. Next step, next uh, slide, sorry. 
So in summary, um, there's a lot of chronic pain. There's way too much chronic pain. Um, there's a lot of evidence, and it's growing, for non-drug options for chronic pain um, and lots of different kinds of interventions there to choose from. Next slide. And um, that a lot of things have been found better than the pharmacological interventions, um, and so should be considered and brought into the multimodal approaches. And I'm thank you, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Um, see from a response that we're getting from some of the audience that folks have been finding this and information about the alternatives really very interesting. So, so thank you very much and. Um, I think that the way you discussed, the depth that you discussed, some of the range of possibilities, um, it certainly piqued some interest, I know, um, in some of the responses that we're seeing. I want to actually thank both of uh, the presenters right now, and we're going to move towards uh, a discussion, hopefully, and some questions uh, did come up in the chat box and the presenter chats as well. And so I'm going to turn this over to Samantha. Um, I do want to mention, uh, before I do so, there's some resource slides. Maybe, Samantha, you can just kind of go right through them. Uh, you can see that there's several slides. Next slide. Um, that have some of the resources that are available at SAMHSA, at the Department of Veteran Affairs, at NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the Center for Disease Control. These are all tools. There's a number of um, wonderful tools, such as the one there that has motivational interviewing that you can take back to your work and your team uh, if you want to know more about some of the techniques that were discussed. Next slide. And particularly, there's some resources listed that back into some of the presentations that you hear today. Um, and that includes um, some of the information about chronic pain and op opioids. Next slide as well as the CAP SAMHSA prevention information that's here. Um, I would urge you to take time and look at some of these things. You know, we can't do everything in a webinar, and this uh, information will certainly close the gap a bit more. Um, so now I'm going to turn the questions over to you, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. So the first question that we have is for Dr. Gordon. Um, it's, what is the goal of the VA pain program model described? So I'm just going to pull up the slide that they are referencing. Yeah, hi, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, Samantha. And, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for being on the call today. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that's happened over the course of the last 10 to 20 years is a really readjustment of how uh, we address pain and what are our goals. Uh, as many of you know, uh, in uh, the early 2000s, it was the decade of the brain, and it was also a decade of saying that uh, pain was a fifth vital sign. And oftentimes, uh, at least historically, uh, uh, the, the idea was to reduce or eliminate pain. Uh, a paradigm shift has happened over the last five years with regards to pain treatment, and it really has been that it's not necessarily a reduction of pain, but it's an improvement of function. Um, and it's one reason why uh, Dr. Herman's con uh, uh, comments were extremely important, is that many of these therapies that uh, were described uh, do improve function. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the ability to, for anything to get anything down to a zero pain is maybe not a feasible goal. So uh, in the VA, recently the, the goal has really been to reduce pain, but more importantly to improve function, uh, to improve uh, quality of life, uh, to improve uh, the whole gamut of uh, whole health uh, that uh, patients have. So, uh, and, and you're gonna see this outside the VA as well. Many uh, large healthcare systems are doing this as well. Uh, and recognizing that, uh, uh, and even probably eliminating this pain as a fifth vital sign approach, uh, because it's not the pain, uh, it's the function that we're after. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. We also have another question for you. Is there a specific screening instrument that is used to identify patients who misuse opiates? That's a, that would be another two-hour presentation about all the screening uh, and assessment tools that are available to providers. Uh, technically, as many people know, the United States Preventive Services Task Force does not recommend uh, a screen instrument for opiate use disorder or opiate misuse currently in primary care practices. 
there are several instruments that have been developed in order to assess when you are thinking that a patient may be misusing or potentially misusing uh, prescription opiates or opiates in general. Uh, there are many tools out there. One of the tools that I generally tend to recommend is that of uh, Smith that was uh, published in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2010. It has two, two modal approaches for a screening test, not a case finding or not an assessment test, but a screening test. The, the question, it's one question for, for direct, direct question is how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? So it's how many times have you used a legal medication, drug, or prescription medication for non-medical reasons. And interestingly, in that study, again, Archives of Internal Medicine 2010, a indirect question was that was a pretty good assessment of opiate misuse was in the last year, have you consumed more than four drinks on one occasion in one city? Which is uh, basically based off the uh, audit or the alcohol use disorders identification test. So even assessing whether someone drinks alcohol may predict someone for being, you should inquire if it's positive, that they should inquire that uh, they may have opiate misuse. But that all being said, uh, there is no standard uh, screening instrument that the VA is providing or is recommended nationally in primary care um, for opiate uh, misuse, uh, a prescription of opiates. Uh, many of you in the community are using the ASSIST, which is a, it's a good screening test for a whole gamut of uh, different uh, um, substances of abuse, uh, including tobacco and alcohol, um, and it's a good uh, additional test to uh, provide patients in order to uh, see if, if they have been using substances. But technically, there's not a recommendation nationally for all primary care patients to receive this uh, screening tool. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. So we have a few questions for Dr. Herman. The first one is, in acupuncture, how is chronic pain different from pain from specific causes such as osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis? Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to what we were showing on the evidence map there. And um, the the bubbles got labeled the way they are because that is what the study said it was looking at. Um, so we would have to actually dig down into the particular um, studies to find out for sure. Um, but uh, pretty much um, I would guess that the, a bubble that is just pain versus one that's chronic pain, uh, the chronic pain studies that were represented by that bubble are only including patients who have pain of three months or longer, um, whereas the other study might have taken all comers, and so there, therefore the, the effect on those with um, chronic pain was diluted somewhat. Um, uh, does, does that answer the question, I hope? Yes, I think if the person posing the question has any follow-up questions, please feel free to send them in. Um, but we'll move on to the next question for you as well, which is, are the studies you were referring to also measuring changes in emotional suffering as it relates to chronic pain? A number of the studies did go in and do different measures of depression and anxiety and um, just coping, other types of things, but that was not consistently done across all those uh, all of those studies. So there's not been as many kind of systematic reviews that looked at that in general. Great, thank you. So there's a question for Dr. Gordon. Um, a question that was posed is, is SBIRT delivered at VA facilities? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, SBIRT is uh, an acronym that stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, Referral to Treatment. Uh, that uh, much of the formative work with regards to SBIRT, uh, particularly for unhealthy alcohol consumption, or hazardous alcohol consumption, or what many researchers and policymakers are now saying, saying unhealthy uh, alcohol consumption is a quantity of consumption that places a patient at risk for alcohol-related harm. 
Uh, Espert has been early adopted in the uh, VA. Uh, we currently screen every pay primary care patient using the audit C, which is the alcohol use disorder identification test, three item questionnaire, which assesses not only the frequency that someone drinks, but how much they drink when they do drink, as well as a binge question, uh, do you drink more than uh, five drinks or more on one occasion in the course of last year? A positive screen will prompt the VA clinician to uh, provide a brief intervention, usually a, a, a motivational interviewing approach in order to uh, have that patient reduce or cut down their alcohol consumption. Uh, and uh, obviously in the VA, we have readily access to specialty care services uh, or, and or motivational interviewers uh, and uh, counselors who can do this uh, uh, expert uh, component. Uh, in the VA, uh, uh, mirroring what is recommended nationally, uh, it's, the expert is really only for uh, patients with uh, alcohol use uh, or, uh, excuse me, at risk alcohol consumption. Uh, the evidence, as many of you know, is not robust for expert with regards to drug misuse or for alcohol use disorder, which is the more serious form of, of alcohol problems. Uh, and, and in those situations, uh, uh, a medication therapy and or uh, a intense uh, a treatment of using non-medical uh, components can be uh, much more effective than a brief intervention. And that's what's recommended uh, for uh, particularly in primary care settings or in early engagement emergency room settings, et cetera. Uh, so, yes, we use FASPR quite a bit for alcohol use disorder, or actually at-risk alcohol consumption, uh, and uh, that's the screen that is provided on a national basis, on an annual basis for all primary care providers, patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Another question that we had come in from a participant is that in their health system, which is not VA, it's been very challenging to recruit providers who are willing to provide buprenorphine. Could you talk at all about uh, use of buprenorphine in VA and non-VA providers? So I would be happy if the audience wants to come back and talk about this issue. It's a very vexing issue uh, for many providers, not only in the VA, but outside the VA. And much of my research has been in this area. Um, I'm an implementation scientist about how you have a space practice like you can work feed into a non uh, specialty care settings. So uh, I'll just give you the, the brief, really brief rundown about how to encourage providers to do it. One of the rate major f uh, barriers that we're seeing out there is many providers believe that they start using buprenorphine to treat patients with uh, opiate use disorder, that they will get flooded with patients who want this medication. So one of the steps that we've learned over the time to help implement this into primary care practices, whether it be the VA or the non-VA setting, is to encourage them to say, these patients are already in your practice. We, we want to provide a tool to help your patients, not necessarily attract new patients to you, but patients that are already within your patient panels. And providers who get that message generally feel much more emboldened to at least try it among patients that they are familiar with, who they have a already a rapport with, rather than to worry about new patients that are coming into their practice. Uh, and and you, you must, in many ways, in many ways try to uh, stress that we're not trying to make you a drug and alcohol treatment program. Uh, we want you, or we want to help you, take care of your patients who may not need specialty care services for addiction in a drug and alcohol treatment program. The mild, maybe even moderate patients with opioid disorder can be treated effectively within primary care. And if you start with your patients that you are familiar with, um, it, uh, or at least stress that for a provider, they're more likely to uh, potentially use this medication in their practice. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. So this question is not posed to either presenter, but we welcome either of you to answer. Um, the question is, how well does cognitive behavioral therapy work in group settings? In the study that I went into a little bit of detail on, it went very well in group settings. Um, there, that often, um, and it hasn't been compared one-on-one -on -one against individualized uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, 
I, I don't know of anybody that's done that yet, but um, there could be something about the group interaction that helps there. Um, I, I hope that study is done sometime t soon, given how well it worked uh, for the chronic pain population there. This is Adam Gordon. Uh, the only other comment, I totally agree with Dr. Herman. I, I think one of the things that uh, we often struggle with is that we're trying to say, find one magic bullet therapy. Oftentimes, can be, uh, CBT, for example, can be very effective for some patients individually, and for other patients, may be very effective in group settings. And other patients may not do, do well with CBT for whatever disorder you're using CBT for. And I think it's incumbent upon us is that we should try uh, different, uh, whether individual group or other modalities, and make sure that, that if they don't work with one thing, that they are encouraged to try the other. And I think that's what we are challenged with with regards to the difficult pain patient, is that oftentimes we think that one modality and only one modality will work for that patient. And, and it's really not, it should not be the case. We have to find the patient-centric intervention that works for them for not only their pain, but potentially for their addiction down the road. Um, and I'm going to definitely second that, um, this Dr. Herman again. Um, one of the benefits and one of the reasons why we wanted to look in these different studies that I talked about across all of these different interventions is to basically say there's a smorgasbord of options out there. And and they are all, you know, there's a large number of things that have been shown to be effective. And patient preference comes in here and what somebody's willing to do. Someone might have a, you know, severe aversion to needles and never want to get near acupuncture or they're afraid of, you know, uh, having their back cracked, you know, by a chiropractor or something like that. But across all of these things, there's there's... You know, no one magic bullet of another. I think a lot of these studies are now being done to show that they are as good as rather than better than. We're not looking for the magic bullet, as, as Dr. Gordon puts it. Um, this, this, uh, I think that this is um, really good news for difficult chronic pain patients is because you have options galore for them. And I would just also echo, since we are on a SAMHSA call, that you know maybe this same approach of a smorgasbord of treatment modalities uh, can be also applied not only to pain, but for patients with addiction or opiate use disorder. Uh, we need to be incumbent on us to find the appropriate and patient-centric approach for uh, these patients as they um, are dealing with this chronic disease. Thank you both. So I think the last question we have here pertains to the V8 STORM tool. So does the STORM tool currently have any overlap with the REACH VET initiative? If not, are there any plans to overlap the two predictive models in the future since the primary goal of each is suicide prevention among veterans? You know, the simple answer is yes. So it's using the same uh, data for both the uh, dashboards for uh, the REACH VET program as well as the STORM tool. I did not talk about suicide prevention. That's another probably topic that we could really go into uh, on another webinar. But uh, the, the data elements in the VA are, are very similar across uh, uh, different dashboards or metrics. The, just to inform everybody, the STORM tool, which I mentioned in my presentation, is really about opiate risk assessment and, uh, and mitigation strategies, mainly geared toward that primary care provider. Oftentimes, the REACH VET initiative is really geared toward the mental health provider uh, in order to help with uh, reducing uh, uh, and predictive modeling of potential suicidality as well as attempts or, or completions. And so, there's a different. There are different metrics in each of the the dashboards or the predictive models, uh, but it's using the same sources and it's the same kind of mechanism. Uh, there are um, when you, we're asking about whether they link. They they certainly do link if someone does have a opiate use uh, as well as a uh, suicidality uh, uh, assessment as well as a concern. Uh, oftentimes, the providers are looking at both those in order to help reduce the risks associated with it. People with pain, uh, people with opiate use disorder, or mental health diagnoses are certainly at high risk for opiate-related uh, morbidity mortality, 
And likewise, patients who have opiate risks or mental health disorders or pain are much more likely to have suicidality. So uh, oftentimes the dashboards are very similar with the metrics, but there's a little bit of tweaking because of the specifics of the provider, but not only what, uh, also looking at the disease that we're looking at, suicidality versus opiate disorder or, uh, or opiate uh, risk assessment mitigation. Thank you. Great question. I, I see Thank question you, here Gordon. that uh, why why did what does UC stand for again? I'll just I'll just help help you all with that. UC usually stands for usual care. I imagine that's what the acronym is for for Dr. Herman. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Herman, as well as Dr. Gordon. Um, in some of the discussion that came up, you know, one of the issues that surfaced um, was a question around suicide prevention and the connection um, with opiate addiction and, and substance use. And so I did want to highlight the fact that one of the things the TA Center is real excited about is in this coming year, that very priority is um, going to be something we are able to direct some real federal resources towards. And in that respect, um, we've just identified seven cities that will be working uh, with the VA and SAMHSA on what's being called the Mayor's Challenge, which is to, to address the suicide rates in the community of those uh, service members and veterans that have not connected with uh, the, the VA's care. And, and it's our hope that in working with um, the systems that are out there and the teams that are out there, and that's a blended team of military and civilian players that work in cities, that we'll be able to help them implement some of the best practices. And some of the things that were mentioned today, for instance, would be invaluable to our thinking, understanding better about the connections to the VA. But that work is going to grow, and there'll be an opportunity for more counties, communities, cities um, to access um, resources for technical assistance to address issues such as opiate addiction and, um, and its link with suicide prevention uh, activities because we know that there's a high percentage of alcohol use, et cetera, that, uh, and poisonings actually that kind of all, all get kind of jumbled up in this issue um, as people seek solutions to pain. So um, thank you. I wanted to mention that because you can uh, reach out to the TA Center for any answers to any of the questions that you have that did not get addressed today. Uh, there was a slide that was shown at the end that has how you can reach us, and we, in fact, can help you connect. If you have questions for the presenters, we'll be following up with you. Um, I'd like to pass it back to the group. Is there anyone else has a comment or Cicely? Thanks, Donna. This is Cicely again from SAMHSA. Just a wonderful uh, afternoon of information and sharing. I think the questions outline the fact that there was an engaged audience today. Uh, listening and trying to identify areas that this information might be relevant to the work you're all doing. We can't thank all of you enough for taking this time because truly there's not a single community across our nation that's not addressing this issue and the critical work that we have to do as a community to support our nation's veterans and their families and our service members and their families as they struggle through um, some of these pain issues is just all too relevant. So. Again, thank you all. We really appreciate your time. If there's any issues or questions from the relevant uh, web, webcast materials, our TA Center stands ready to answer those. And we're, again, so grateful for the National Center providing us this platform and getting this out to you as an archived webinar shortly. All right, and I just also want to thank you all for attending today's webinar, SAMHSA's Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families Technical Assistance Center presents Strategies for Pain Management and the Prevention of Opiate Misuse Amongst Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families. So once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would really appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email by the end of the week with a link to view the recording of today's webinar as well as a PDF of the slides. Just a reminder, these will also be posted on the National Council's Webinar Archives page within 48 hours as well, if you want to be accessing them or sharing the link. So on behalf of the National Council Policy Research Associates and SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your day.